so what I want to do today is to just review why fusarium mycotoxins are an issue and look at the legal limits that apply and then look at the factors influencing mycotoxin risk and look at the situation we had for head blight and mycotoxin levels in 2012 and trying to separate those two. And then look at um, where we go on with regards to mycotoxin uh, management. So first of all, the legislation. This was actually introduced into 2006 and it's European legislation. And we have legal limits for unprocessed wheat intended for human consumption. And it's very important to be aware that within this legislation, all farmers are classed as food operators. So farmers, those farmers amongst you, your, your customers, do not always see themselves as food operators. But according to legislation, they're food operators. And at the point of sale, it's their legal responsibility to ensure that wheat sold for human consumption is fit for human consumption. So it has to meet these legislative limits. So we have limits for deoxynivalenol, which I refer to as DON, zealarone, which I refer to as ZON, and there's been some proposed limits some time now for HT2 and T2, and we still don't have these, and they've actually changed again. We now have, uh, or we're likely to have, um, a publication of investigative limits uh, next year, and it's changed for wheat, it's going to be 50 ppb, or it's likely to be 50 ppb. And these investigative limits mean that as uh, the Food Standards Agency and food operators, so again HGCA will be taking on this remit, have to monitor HT2 and T2 in cereals and cereal products. And where they are identified to be high, they have to investigate why they are high and what they can do to reduce them. Uh, we do have limits for feed, but they're only guideline limits. And again, they were introduced in 2006. But again, the Commission warned that if you just... We'll set guidelines. If you ignore them, we'll set legislation. So it is important to be aware of guideline limits for feed as well. Also, very important that some processors have lower intake limits. And this is if they're producing high-fibre, whole-grain products they have to have lower limits at intake to meet the limits for their end products. And for this reason, it's very important to know what the end user requirements are because if you're trying to get into the baby food industry, you know, it's very difficult to get in there because of the low limits set for infant foods. So, the fusarium mycotoxins, very important. These are produced in the field. So it's a as a result of the fusarium head blight. So they have to be controlled in the field. There's very little you can do once you've harvested the crop. You can get some reduction through cleaning, but you don't get a big reduction. The key ones, deoxynivalenol and HT2 and T2, these are close relatives uh, within the group known as trichophacines. There's many others, and the one that's issued for, for UK cereal production is the alanone which we'll refer to as Zon. Now, two species of fusarium, which we commonly find, Graminiarum and Culmorum, both produce Don and Zon. So we'll very frequently see them together. And Graminiarum is by far the most potent Don producer. So that's the one which we really have to keep an eye on. So worst case scenarios for head blight, warm, dry spring inducing spore production, spore production on the crop debris, Heavy rainfall in June, I'm referring now, this is England, uh, so a bit later in Scotland. So heavy rainfall in June as, as the ears are emerging to splash those spores up onto the ear. And then some warm, dry, sorry, warm, humid conditions during flowering to allow those spores to germinate and get into the ear. And then also, fusarium is monocyclic. We only have one infection event, but... We get later in the season, as the crop ripens, we'll actually get saprophytic growth on the dead crop. And that's what we see with a delayed wet harvest, where we can see an increase in mycotoxins. So looking at the different crops, we see differences in susceptibility. And this is a percentage of crops exceeding legal limits. And this is 2002 to 2008. 
And for wheat, you see that uh, the issue is really Don and Zialanone, and we're averaging around 5% exceeding legal limit. So 5% is not a big issue for the industry. The problem is finding that 5%. Um, and that's one of the major issues we have. And also the fluctuation. So in brackets there, we have the range, and I'll come on to the ranges. For HT2 and T2, um, we've now got this uh, proposed limit of 50 ppb, much less of an issue in wheat. And in recent years, we haven't had any samples exceeding that limit. And again, we don't know why, but HT2 and T2 in recent years has fallen back in wheat. Big issues are potential issues for oats, uh, but at the moment, as I say, it's investigative limits, and we are actively working on trying to identify what we can do for the issue on oats, and I won't cover that today. So looking at the, the seasonal variation we have in wheat, you can see that we've got big fluctuations. Where we have dry June weather, we have very low incidence, and an example of that would be uh, 2006, 2010, and 2011. And it's quite critical when we have that rainfall. So as long as we have some uh, early dry June, we don't see much of an issue. Where we do have issues is examples of 2008. We had a wet June and we had a wet delayed harvest. And you'll see the percentage there for Don and Zialarone, we have a bigger issue with Zon when we have a delayed harvest because Zon is produced at the end of the growing season, uh, whereas Don is produced during the infection. So where we have a delayed harvest, the levels of zealerone increase. And you'll see there, 2004, 2008 was when we had our delayed harvests and had particular problems with zealerone. So HGCA have been monitoring fusarium mycotoxin since 2001. And the idea was that we knew the legislation was on its way. The European Union eventually get round to setting legislation. It take many years to do it. They'd been discussing this legislation for a number of years. We knew it was on its way. So the HGCA set up a monitoring project in 2001 to identify how much of an issue it was for the UK industry and what we could actually do about it. The legislation said we had to use good agricultural practice. We needed to identify what that good agricultural practice was. So we quantified the fusarium mycotoxins and we model uh, the mycotoxin content against the agronomy. And I'm just going to run through some of the factors which then led to the fusarium risk assessment. So the first one is the seasonal and regional variation. And you can see there that there's massive variation between years and regions. And there's a significant interaction of the two. The normal trend is that it's higher in the south and the east and it declines northwards. Fusarium needs a certain temperature for spore development in the spring. And this hasn't been identified exactly yet, but it appears from recent data that it needs around 12 degrees average temperature for spore development. And that's why we're not seeing it once we get into northern Scotland, because we're not getting high enough temperatures in the spring for the spores to develop in time for um, them to be released when the wheat's flowering. So we have this decline as we progress northwards, but you'll see there in 2008 that it kind of levelled everything out. Within England, we had high levels across, and that's because the delay in harvest was worse as we moved northwards. The proportion of crop that was delayed increased as we moved northward, northwards, so that levelled out those differences across the regions. Looking at the difference between uh, impacts of previous crop and cultivation, we see a significant interaction. And the big factor is following maize as a previous crop, and particularly following maize and mintil. Now, maize is the preferred host for Fusarium graminearum, which is the most potent don producer. And if you leave that debris on the surface, then you have very large levels of inoculum. You'll see that all the other crops is very little difference, but we do see there are some slight differences. And in this data set, uh, you can see that sugar beet uh, as a previous crop, and mintil is slightly higher risk than the others, and that's been seen in some other countries. Now, you have to remember that this is observational data, there's lots of other factors. The sugar beet, if you're following wheat after sugar beet, it's, it's a late wheat crop, and late sowings are also increasing risk. 
So there's a number of factors in there. And we're seeing increasing levels of grain maize being produced. We've got grain maize grown under plastic in the Midlands now. Grain maize is worse than forage maize, probably because there's a lot more trash left behind, but it's also later harvested and it's different varieties. So there's a number of factors that may be important there. Looking at tillage, we haven't got a lot of data in the UK on differences in tillage, but there's been a lot of work done in France, and this is data from Arvalis. And they've looked at different cultivation practices following maize. And I don't know if you can see on the photos there, that's the different levels of debris after the different cultivations. But what they show is that the more intensive the, culti the mintil cultivation, the more chopping and mixing you get then the greater reduction in don you get in the following wheat crop. So ploughing gives you the greatest reduction, but within mintil there is a range, because mintil is a continuum of different practice, the more intensive the mintil, then the greater the reduction you can see. Looking at varieties, in the UK there's very little difference. Um, on a worldwide stage they're all susceptible. But we do have slight differences, and you can see as we have uh, the more resistant varieties, we have a, a lower dawn. The, the odd one there is uh, the score of three, but that was actually very few samples um, from a single variety ambrosia, uh, which disappeared. So that would explain that uh, difference. But for where we have five, sixes, and sevens, which is hundreds of data, there's evidence that you do see a decline as you have a more resistant variety. Moving on to fungicides, I know you won't be able to read this, but it was just to demonstrate where the information is. So in the Winter Wheat Disease Management Guide, we have uh, scores for ear blight control. None of it is control, it's only reduction. And it's really the um, triazoles that, that you've got there. There's a couple of MBCs with two stars but you're really looking at metconazole, tebiconazole, and proficonazole, and various things that they exist within. Timing is critical, growth stage 59.65. People ask me when's the optimum timing. The optimum timing is just before an infection event. It doesn't matter what growth stage your crop's at, if it's in that infection window, and all I can say is that the ideal timing is dependent on the weather, and if you've got a dry forecast, you can hold off for fusarium control. Obviously, you've got foliar top-up considerations as well, but for fusarium control, you have to look at the weather. If you've got to grow stage 59 and it's a uh, rain forecast, you need to get on. Five good dry days, you can hold off until there's some rain forecast. And you need robust rates when disease pressure is high. And, sorry, going back to this uh, timing, when you've got several infection events, which we had this year, we probably had about eight infection events over a 14-day period, there is no optimum timing. You're just not going to get good control. At Harper Adams, we've actually looked at different timings earlier in the season, some of the foliar applications, and there's evidence of some control from both T1 and T2. These are only small reductions, but they are additive. So at each time, if you put in on a, full, a fusarium active product, you will get some additive benefit from that. And there is some work, we've not done work uh, on seed treatments, and people who have, on small uh, plot studies, you don't see a benefit, but the inoculum will just spread over the season from small plots. But Syngenta have done... Uh, surveys of commercial crops, thousands of commercial crops, and the data from France and Germany shows that you will get a significant benefit from a fusarium active seed treatment, in, in their case looking at berry gold. So seed treatments you can get, or you do get significant benefit, and we've shown benefits from T1 and T2 times, but the important thing is T3 is by far the most important one. And I've probably just said everything I wanted to say about that slide there. Obviously, with the earlier sprays, you, you, your primary choice is on the, on the foliar control. So fusarium reduction is only your secondary choice or a, a secondary reason why you might choose a particular product. It's obviously not a primary choice. 
The HGCA continue to publish uh, updates on the HGCA risk assessment. There were no changes this year, but the, the, the risk assessment was again released as a new topic sheet. The situation in 2012 is because of the high risk, NABIM continue to require an assessment score and a DOM test. So each year, all the early season testing that's done, and there's thousands of tests done by NABIM and AICC, that data is collated and there's a stakeholder meeting to look at the strategy for that year. And in a high risk year, the decision is that the continue requirement of a DON test. So that's the situation this year. So the details need to be reported on the grain passport. And I'm not sure if this has actually occurred yet, but some mills, although the NABIM national policy is for requestment, request a DON test, some mills may re relax this due to local regional risk. So if they're in a low risk area, they could ask not request a, a DON test. So I'll very quickly go through the risk assessment. And it's basically, from the earlier slides, explained due to the different factors. So you've got your different regional risk, your different previous crop risk, different levels of cultivation, and then your differences in wheat variety. And all that is your pre-flowering risk. So you can look at your, your score pre-flowering and make an assessment on fungicide application. And then with your T3 fungicides, you can actually get a reduction in your score <coughs> by using a recommended product. And then it's all down to the weather, the amount of rainfall at flowering, and the amount of rainfall pre-harvest as the crops ripening. The actual risk assessment is available on the HGSA website in various formats. You can download Excel spreadsheets, there's an online version, and there's PDF files. And this is just a summary of a good agricultural practice identified. The use of fusarium resistant varieties, consideration of rotation, particularly avoiding maize as a previous crop, cultivation, looking to plough, or if you're going to, into min till, the more chopping and mixing, the better. Uh, looking at a decent rate of a recommended head blight product. I haven't mentioned lodging, but it's all down to how long the crop is sat wet prior to harvest. And obviously, if it's on the ground, it's sat wet a lot longer. And I don't like telling farmers to have a timely harvest. You don't sit around wondering when to cut the wheat. But it is important for milling wheat that you get those wheats in. So now I'm just going to say a little bit about 2012 and, and what, what actually happened um, with regards head blight, because we saw a lot of reports of head blight and we've obviously got this reduction in yields. We had a cool and wet early summer. The temperature actually dropped, the, the, the crop was advanced, the temperature dropped and the cr crop just basically stopped growing and very slowly went through growth stages when it was sensitive to head blight, so head emergence and flowering were, were very slow. We had numerous heavy rainfall events through this period. Uh, the cool conditions actually favour microdochium. Microdochium is quite happy at 15 degrees C. Fusarium graminearum is a continental pathogen. It prefers 25 <coughs> degrees C. So these cool temperatures uh, were in preference to microdochium. Microdochium causes head blight, doesn't produce any mycotoxins. There are also uh, reports that untreated plots with no leaf canopy had less disease. And this was something reported in the press. And this would indicate the importance of this, um, the, the leaf canopy within the splash, splashing of spores from the ground up onto the ears, so this stepwise splash using the, the leaves as a, a ladder for this splashing. And we had poor control, and lots of people complain of poor control, but this timing was critical. You need to be next to a single infection event. When you've got numerous infection events, you won't get good control. And product choice. When it comes to microdochium, we've taken our eye off microdochium. We last had an epidemic in 1998, so there's no, you know, there's no justification for continuing trying to control microdochium when it occurs every 14 years. But with microdochium, the triazoles are weaker against microdochium, and particularly you've got less control. I've seen some recent data from Ferra where your tebiconazole and metconazole are particularly weak against uh, microdochium compared to fusarium. 
uh, your profile conazole will give you reasonable control. And since 1998, we've had strobal urine resistance come in. And from the, the samples of the HGCA survey, we've actually looked at fusarium resistance, sorry, microdochium resistance to strobes, and it's endemic. It's in every field. Lots of samples like this. You see the ones on the left, the lights are a bit bright, but the ones on the left were still fairly green. You can see lots of individual spikelets infected. Most infection was like this, where you get single spikelets and not the spread, and that's very typical of microdochium. The only one with any graminearum in is this one, and you can see here's an infected spikelet, and you've got senescence above the point of infection, so that's typical of graminearum. If you have those symptoms, in, it's not clear, and particularly fusarium graminearum, when it starts, will look like this, and then it'll block the rachis and you'll get the senescence higher up. If you want to identify what's microdochium, what's fusarium, put it in a plastic bag, leave it five days, and the microdochium will stay a nice straw coloured, and the fusarium will go nice rosy pink red. So you can distinguish between the microdochium and the fusarium you've got in the field. Very useful to do a count in the field because these things stand out like sore thumbs and it looks severe, but if you actually count the incidence, it's often very low. But you only need 1% graminearum to be around the legal limit. So although... They, you, you often only have a very low incidence, you only need, if it's fusarium graminearum, you only need a low incidence. If it's pink, it doesn't prove it's graminearum, it just probably is. It just means risk-wise you're at graminearum levels. I'm just going to present some data from Crop Monitor. So this is Ferra data from their National Winter Wheat Disease Survey. They're monitoring the levels of the actual fusarium species every year. Highest we've seen on record with regards, on the left hand side we have fusarium head blight levels, both number of fields and incidence within fields was highest ever. On the right hand side that's fusarium graminearum, again the highest we've seen. Um, and there you see the, the fields that were infected, about 40% of fields, the average incidence was 3.5%. High risk of exceeding mycotoxin levels. And they were putting out the Don prediction pre harvest has been high. If we look at the results we've got so far this year, so we've only got 130 samples uh, analysed, we've still got about another 30 to go. We're looking at currently about 11% exceeding the Don limit and about 15% exceeding the Zialron limit. So there is a, a high level, but nowhere near as high as 2008. So this early prediction uh, from the ferro data has been seen when we actually analyse the mycotoxin content. So if we look at what happened in 2012, this wet June gave us a very high risk, but the cool temperature actually reduced the risk. And we're very fortunate that we had the microdochium. You might think, looking at the season and the impact that microdochium's probably had on yield and quality, that we're not that fortunate. But if you compare the levels of mycotoxins we had to somewhere like Canada, which had an epidemic in 96 with rainfall very similar to what we had, they were just five degrees higher with an average temperature of 20 degrees, and 96% of their crop was above their limit for Don. So, if we'd had the levels of graminearum that we had of microdochium, we'd have been a lot worse off. So microdochium in our cooler climate was actually dominating, and that held back the amount of uh, mycotoxin we had. We didn't have too much of a delay, and therefore the zealorone wasn't as high as we saw in 2012. So our cool, wet summer. We know the cool, wet summer actually had a serious impact on yield and harvest quality, and the, the average yield is down... 15% probably. Um, we know some of this is a direct impact on, on yield through weather because of the reduced sunlight. We know that photosynthesis was limited. 
We don't know how much of it was actually an indirect effect by head blight. Uh, Microdokin routinely is not a big yield hitter and not a big specific weight hitter. You'd normally only see maybe a 5 to 10% reduction with a very high level of microdokium. But this year it seems to have been having a bigger effect. This may have been because it was an earlier infection. It was getting in. The crops were sat during ear emergence for a long period. We may have had heavier infections because of the cooler temperatures and the microdokium dominating. And it may be in combination with the direct effects of the weather itself. We're currently assessing all HGCA RL wheat trials and we're going to quantify all the microdocum and fusarium within that material and that will help us distinguish the direct and indirect impacts of the microdocum and fusarium on yield and quality. And we'll be able to look at the differences with regards to varietal resistance to microdocum and fusarium because again we have no data on that. So where do we go for 2013? We're currently at a higher risk than average because of the levels of inoculum within the seed material, in the crop debris and in the soil. And Gramniarum will survive in all of those. When it comes to actual seed quality, it's been an issue this year. Thankfully, germination through cleaning, people are managing to get the germination acceptable. As long as the germination is good, then uh, the fusarium pathogen shouldn't be a big issue. Microdokium is always going to be a big issue if you're going into cold, wet seed beds. So anything trying to get wheat in now, it's important to have data on the microdokium content. Next year, currently at high risk, but it's all dependent on the weather. Dry June, then we won't have the issues. Just to highlight future developments, uh, currently, the current project on the fusarium modelling is incorporation of weather data and try and get more local weather data into modelling. And the ultimate aim is to have an online system where risk can be predicted at various growth stages and at various scales, both national, regional and at farm level. And we've just got a two-year extension from HGCA to actually validate the new model we have. Also on the uh, varieties... HGCA are funding a, a DEFRA link project called INSPIRE, which is lo looking at integrating uh, mycotoxin or, or resistance genes within to both wheat and barley and integrating that with fungicide technology. And just need to acknowledge since 2001, we've had thousands of samples from the, from the industry. Uh, the original projects, we had samples through AICC, AgriVista, Scottish Agronomy and DAD in Northern Ireland. And then in the more recent projects, they've been coordinated by FERRA uh, through the actual DEFRA-funded winter wheat disease survey material. And thank you for your time. <laughs>